What's up, party people? Let's talk about rivets. So rivets are how we are going to join together our second project. Rivets are a way of joining together pieces of metal without using heat. So it's great for doing at home where you might not have heat sources. To rivet, you need some metal usually two pieces because the whole point of a rivet is to join metal. However, there is such thing as a decorative rivet where you just drill a hole sometimes in one piece of metal and put rivets for decoration. Or maybe you want someone to think that you riveted something together when you didn't. So there are applications where you would only rivet one piece of metal, but for our application in class, you need two pieces of metal. You need a way to drill holes, which for my students, you will most likely do in the studio before you go to your home setup. Um, you need hammers. So we're going to be riveting with these two hammers. This is called a riveting hammer. Surprise! Um, it has a flat face here, and it has a cross peen. So we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but cross peen is going to stretch metal perpendicular to the direction of the peen. So this is gonna stretch metal this way. And that's gonna be important to know later when we're using it to hammer a rivet. So that's a riveting hammer. You could also use a chasing hammer. This is specifically designed for chasing and repasse, which is not something we're going to be doing this semester. However, um, I find that intro students especially seem to understand this hammer better. So it has a flat face on one side. Sometimes they have one that's more domed than this one is. And then it's got a ball peen on the other. So a ball peen is going to stretch metal in all directions. It's going to stretch it outwards. Um, whereas our riveting hammer only stretches metal up and down. And then um, at home, I have this steel block. Um, in the studio, you would use an anvil to do your riveting, but I don't have an anvil here. Um, and this is much smaller, much less expensive, and um, more portable, so I can even take it places with me. Um, and then you'll need your typical finishing tools, files, sandpaper, etc. So riveting should be done after any heating. Riveting works because we're going to drill a hole through our two pieces of metal, stick a wire in, and then hammer the ends of it, which is gonna stretch the ends over the wire where it can't come out. If you then heat the metal, it anneals the wire and the wire can be pulled out. So if you're going to texture, that needs to be done first. If you're going to solder, um, maybe a pin back or a brooch back or something, that needs to be done first. Riveting should really be the last or, or almost last step. Um, it also needs to be said that like, for example, with this piece, which is super tiny, um, I need to file and sand all of these edges before I rivet it down. Once it's riveted down, I'm not gonna be able to easily get to those edges without scratching my base piece. Um, so, um, and then in some cases, depending on the level, like how you've layered your metals and what kind of metals you have, if you've got multiple layers of copper and you want some to be dark and some to still be copper, you might even patina before you rivet your piece together. It really, that really kind of depends, but riveting should be one of the very last things you're doing. Definitely after heating. All right, so I have my two pieces of scrap metal here that I'm gonna to use to show you. We're going to go over four different kinds of rivets, although not all necessarily right now in this video. Um, the two that I'm going to cover right now are standard rivets, which are 
standard, and hidden rivets, which is a standard rivet that also incorporates a seat to hold the material and then you file it off and if you do it right, it's invisible. And then the other two kinds that will be in a separate video are tube rivets, where there's still an opening for you to put something, and decorative rivets, where we melt a head onto the wire that's like a really pretty little ball and then we only hammer on one side. So those two will be in a separate video. Um, this one is just standard rivets and hidden rivets. So I've got my scraps that I'm going to rivet and then I need to drill some holes. But how do you know what size holes to drill, Stina? Well, that's a good question. And that's when we're going to employ our handy dandy drill bit sides gauge or wire gauge. Got a few names. Mine's obviously been through a lot and it has a lot of numbers on it. You might notice. Um, we're going to turn it this way and use the very top, the very top set of numbers above each hole. Those correspond with our metal working drill bits. Can you use other drill bits on metal? Of course you can. It's just that the metal working ones are numbered from zero to 80. We don't have to worry about fractions and they change in extremely tiny increments. Whereas standard drill bits from the hardware store are done in fractions and they usually come in sixteenths as the smallest changing you can have whereas these change in like micro millimeters which is good because we have so many different gauges of wire um, as an intro student in my class you only have access to 18 gauge wire 16 gauge wire and 14 gauge wire and that's just to make things a little bit easier and then you have access to the drill bits that correspond with that wire. So for example, I have this piece of wire. Now I know that this is the 18 gauge wire, but that's not really all that important right now because I'm trying to find out what size drill bit I need to use to make a hole that this wire will fit through without being too big. So. I just start sticking it through the holes here. That's too big. That's too big. Too big. And then this one down here is just right. It slides through, but I don't have to do a lot of work to get it through there. And that is number 60. So in order to drill a hole that fits this wire, I need a number 60 drill bit. in uh, 49 so it goes in 50 it goes in but I have to really work to get it in there um, but it goes in 49 really easily but it still doesn't jiggle around a lot so 49 is what I want for 14 gauge but you could do this with any wire you can pick it up you put it through Whichever hole fits, that's the size drill bit you need. Same thing if you drop the thing of drill bits and you need to figure out which drill bit goes where, you stick them through the holes. And when you find the one that fits, that's the drill bit it is and that's what container you put it in. It's very simple. I have my holes drilled in my top piece. Um, as you drill holes, you're likely going to have burrs appear on the back, which is just um, flashing from the drill bit and you need to get that off otherwise your metal is not gonna lie still it's not gonna lie flat against your other piece of metal so take a minute it doesn't have to be pretty because that's just gonna be on the inside okay so now I need to drill holes in my other piece of metal that correspond exactly with these and there's a couple ways you can do this. The first and easiest is to lay your metal on exactly where you want. Take a Sharpie. And if your holes are big enough 
for the Sharpie, you just put the Sharpie through like this and mark your holes. Um, depending on what gauge you're using of wire, the hole that you drill may not be big enough to fit the tip of the Sharpie in. If that's the case, um, sometimes you can tape your metal together with masking tape, tape it all together, and then you use this top hole as your divot. And so you just put the drill bit through the top hole and then it can't move around and it'll just drill directly into the bottom hole. So that's a one way to do it. Another way is to do what I just said, lay your metal on, use the top hole to guide the drill bit. And then immediately after you have that hole, stick a piece of wire in it. That way it can't move. Drill another hole, stick a piece of wire in that so it can't move and you can do them that way as well. Mine are wide enough that I was able to use the Sharpie method, so now I'm gonna drill the rest of the holes. Okay, I have holes drilled all the way through um, my two pieces. Now, even though this looks like a square, it clearly is not, look at this one. Um, I am a human, I am imperfect, um, so, it is very important now to remember which way this is oriented. Like if it was a circle or a square, something that I could easily turn and forget which holes belong together, I need to mark those somehow so that I can remember and don't accidentally try to do it like this because they just don't line up. So I'll get one in and then be very sad. So mark your pieces so you can remember how they line up. Next thing I do is I need to measure out some wire. Like I said before, this is 14 gauge wire. How much wire you need can be tricky for some people when they're starting out. The general rule of thumb is that you need a piece of wire that can go through both pieces of your metal and then have excess sticking up that is roughly equivalent to one thickness of the metal. But that equation can change depending on your situation. So this is 18 gauge metal, which is roughly one millimeter thick. I have two pieces of metal. So according to that formula, I need one millimeter of wire sticking up off the top because that's equal to one piece of my metal my two pieces of metal and then one millimeter sticking off the bottom as well, which would be a four millimeter piece of wire. Um, but what I like to say is you generally don't need more than a millimeter um, sticking out. If you have a lot more than that, the wire will just bend off to one side. Um, and then if you have too little, it obviously won't be enough to actually stay in and hold the metal together. So roughly a millimeter um, sticking out of each side is generally enough. If you have very, very thin metal, that might be too much. So that's where the formula comes into play again. Time to cut our wire. They make really awesome things called tube cutters that make cutting tiny pieces of wire very easy. And they're super convenient because they have a, gu a guide that you can set and then you don't even have to measure. You just put the wire against the guide and cut. Put it against the guide and cut. But they're about $75 and I don't have one here at home and it, you probably won't either if you're in my intro class. So I'm going to show you how to do it without that fancy thing. Your first instinct is probably to grab a pair of side cutters or wire cutters, depending on who you are, and cut away, snip, snip. But this poses a problem um, because the wire cutters create a tiny um, bevel. So the ends of the wire, after you use the, the side cutters, the ends of the wire are like this. 
and we need it to be flat. So you certainly can use side cutters, but it's gonna make it really hard to measure because you're gonna need to file off that point and still have the right length of metal. What I do instead is first file off the end of the wire so that you know you're starting with flat wire. Especially when we're talking about measurements as small as four millimeters, you need to start off with completely flat wire because it's gonna get really hard to control that measurement if it's not. Okay, it's completely flat. Now, here's the trick. Get some masking tape. And put it on your wire, like so. Put the wire in the middle as straight as you can and fold it over. Like this, okay? So what is gonna happen is you are going to cut here, but we're gonna stop cutting when we get to the other side of the wire and it's gonna hold together with this little tail of masking tape, which is gonna keep them from flying across the room. <laughs> you don't have to do it this way, but if you choose not to use the masking tape, when you get to the end of your wire, it is just going to go flying and you're gonna be chasing wire the whole time. I highly recommend the masking tape trick. So, put my mark here. So there's four millimeters. Put my mark here, four millimeters. So I'm doing four rivets, so I only need four pieces, but I'm actually gonna cut more than that. Um, that way if I drop one or lose one, I don't have to go try to find it later. Um, that's not always a luxury you have, especially if you're working with more expensive material, but this is just copper and I've got plenty of it. so. I'm going to cut a few extras just to make my life easier. So, made my marks. I get my saw and I put in um, a pretty small blade because that's going to make my life easier. Now, I turn this around because I'm right handed so I have my saw in my right hand. So this way my left hand can hold all the excess. I'm going to put it way in the deep V of my bench pin, and I'm just gonna take my time. The tape also kind of helps it keep from rolling, which is nice. Okay, once I cut through, I stop. I don't keep going through the tape because I want the tape to hold it together. Okay, this time. All right, so now I have tape that has all of my little rivets right there. Pretty awesome, right? All right, I've removed the tape from our rivets. I've already dropped one, but because I cut extras, I didn't have to go searching for it. I just pulled another one off and kept going. Awesome. I need to do one more thing to these before they are ready to use. And that is, I need to file off the burr from the saw. Every time you cut with the saw, you leave a little burr. You leave a little behind. Um, and you need to get rid of that, otherwise it can turn into a um, crack later on. So just hold it with your pliers and file it straight across and then just kind of angle your file and go around the um, circumference of the rivet and do this on both sides. People always try to hold it in their hands and do this, myself included, no judgment here. However, let's work smarter, 
not harder. We've got some pliers. Let's use those. Now I need to put my material in the place where I'm going to rivet. As tempting as it is to use your hands for this, that makes things pretty difficult because they're so small. So now is the time to bust out a pair of pliers. There's just a little bit sticking out on both sides. And so I am going to set this now. I am going to, it's a little tricky at first while it's loose. So I'm going to set it down on my block. So I'm going to do the chasing hammer first using the ball peen end and then on the next one I'll demonstrate the riveting hammer. Hit straight down at first, nice and gentle. Straight down just to kind of spread it out. So I'm going down and then I'm going to tilt the hammer and go around and try and see if I can hit all the way around. I am not hitting very hard. That's key here. Those of you that find you're naturally very strong, now's the time to be gentle. Okay, I've stretched it out a little bit over the top, so I'm going to turn it over. You want to turn it over early so that you don't run out of material. Now, I'm trying to balance it on the wire from the other side. And do the same thing, go straight down and then hit around the perimeter. Okay, now I flip it back over and I keep going. Hit the middle and then hit around the perimeter. The thing I don't like about Ting Hammer is that I always end up making these little divots in my metal um, just from the size of the ball peen um, that you have to sand out. They're not very deep. It doesn't take a long time to sand them out. It's just frustrating to me. So it's in now. They're, they're together, see? Um, and then I always run my hand across it. And if I feel anything sharp, I make sure to go back at like this angle and really tamp those edges down. You don't want them to snag on clothing or anything like that. Okay, I'm going to do this next one over here. I'm going to use the riveting hammer, which is this one. Now, keep in mind, the cross pin is going to stretch metal this way. So, I'm going to hit like this for a little bit, and then I'm going to have to turn it and go the other way. Otherwise, I'll have an oval rivet. Um, otherwise, everything else is the same. So I'm going to hit. And I'm starting off real gentle. And I'm going to turn it over. You see it's already not sliding out. going to turn 90 degrees now. Okay, so I've got that one nice and spread out. So I'm going to switch back over to the top now and keep hammering. So again, I'm trying to balance on that rivet on the opposite side. Okay. So you can see it's definitely more oval from hammering this way. So I'm going to turn it. The thing I do is I'm going to use this flat face. And that just kind of helps get rid of some of the hammer marks. And then just like with the riveting hammer, I kind of tilt it to tamp down those sharp edges. Okay, so here I've got two rivets. 
um, both standard rivets. These are just plain run-of-the-mill rivets. Um, I've got, this one was done with the chasing hammer. This one was done with the riveting hammer. They're both awesome. They both work. Neither is right or wrong.